coming up on Harvard Chan This Week in Health, the growing epidemic of type 2 diabetes in sub-Saharan Africa. In some countries, we found uh, prevalence levels approaching uh, almost, you know, more than 20%. In this week's episode, what's driving an alarming increase in the disease, and how can health systems respond effectively? Hello and welcome to Harvard Chan This Week in Health. I'm Noah Levitt. And I'm Amy Monomiro. This week we'll be examining what researchers are calling a rapidly expanding diabetes epidemic in sub-Saharan Africa. We'll speak with Rafat Atun, professor of global health systems here at the Harvard Chan School. He's one of the lead authors on a first-of-its-kind Lancet Commission report examining the rise of diabetes and possible solutions to the epidemic. According to that report, more than 90% of diabetes cases in sub-Saharan Africa are type 2 diabetes suggesting that modifiable risk factors are major contributors to the burden of disease. Atun told us that researchers were not just shocked by the scale of diabetes in the region, but also how quickly the prevalence of the disease has risen. In 1980, the average prevalence of diabetes in adults over 18 was 3.1%. More than 30 years later, in 2014, it had jumped 150% to 7.1%. But Atun says that averages don't tell the whole story because they can be skewed by countries where diabetes rates are much lower or much higher. And there are sharp disparities among age and gender lines. In some countries, we found um, uh, prevalence levels approaching uh, almost, you know, more than 20%. Um, and what's so worrying is that in, in adults, um, especially um, females uh, who are aged... Um, you know, 30 or 40 years, the prevalence levels reach almost 80 percent. What are some of the factors that are that are driving this increase? Because I think it's interesting that you mentioned that it, there is this huge variation among gender, among age. So I'm guessing there are a lot. I'm guessing it's kind of several factors instead of maybe a few big factors. So what is kind of driving this increase that we're seeing? Yeah, uh, you use the word factors, and you're absolutely right. This factor, this multiple factors, all changing at the same time. So I call these contextual uh, changes. So these transitions, for example, in demographics, so demographic transition with, with aging. Um, secondly, the um, transition in nutrition, transition in social uh, lifestyle or sociocultural attitudes, economic transition, which has brought increased disposable income to, to many, but these uh, these, in, these uh, uh, funds are being used to not to purchase the, the traditional uh, foods, but high-calorie, high low-nutrition low, uh, foods. And reduced exercise, for example, using motorbikes rather than walking to the market or, or to work. All of this together has happened very quickly. And urbanization, which, has, which limits um, capacity for physical exercise. So this convergence of these transitions and their speed of change has resulted in, uh, in an environment where chronic illness growth has really accelerated and has happened very rapidly. Are we seeing, so I know, um, I mean, I guess it's kind of a separate thing, but for example, like we're, they're seeing the rise of like high blood pressure in China. So, I mean, is this kind of a theme that we're seeing in a lot of parts of the world where as there's more modernization and urbanization, we're starting to see these kind of chronic illnesses spike? Yes, what we're seeing is that the countries that are experiencing these rapid transitions, um, so the demographic change and all the other changes collectively uh, help acceleration of the epidemiological change, which brings A, chronic illness, and B, disability because of uh, old age. So we're seeing this in emerging economies, economies that are growing very fast. For example, the BRICS, um, Brazil, Russia, India, as well as um, you know, countries like Mexico, Turkey, that have achieved rapid growth in their e- economies and these transitions, only to face this rapid epidemiological transition. The sharp increase in diabetes is particularly concerning, Atun says, because health systems in sub-Saharan Africa are not prepared to respond. That's because for the last several decades, these countries have been focusing attention on a range of severe health issues, such as infectious diseases like malaria or HIV, and on improving maternal and child health. But now they're facing a wave of chronic illnesses and non-communicable diseases. On the one hand, we have the current problems, so-called the um, uh, sort of remaining challenges of infection and uh, high levels of maternal mortality 
as well as uh, infant mortality or child mortality in these countries, then we see a swathe of uh, new burden emerging due to chronic illness. But health systems are not designed to cope with this burden or manage chronic illness. And the danger is, of course, we're success we'll be successful in treating children and uh, save lives of mothers and improve uh, management of infectious disease only to find that these individuals develop chronic illness that's not managed. That's a huge uh, societal loss beyond, of course, the health burden. And what is it about uh, non-communicable disease like diabetes that is so stressing for health systems? Like, wh I guess, why are they not prepared to, to deal with this? So with infectious disease, typically uh, there's a very clear intervention and the infection is treated. Uh, say for malaria. Uh, for HIV, we now have uh, very effective antiretroviral treatments. The difference with chronic illness is that this is lifelong. And for someone who starts, uh, who develops diabetes or hypertension at the age of, say, 20 or 30, uh, they will have this disease for 30, 40, 50 years. And it requires not just treatment, but a lot of behavior change. And behavior change is very difficult. And the impact of the diabetes epidemic will be felt in many ways as a tomb. Of course, there is the health of individuals and the complications linked to diabetes, such as damage to the eyes, kidneys, and heart, and peripheral nerve damage. This also comes with a long-term economic burden because those battling diabetes may not be able to work. And, and often these individuals have multiple morbidities. Uh, they, will, they may also have hypertension. They will develop ischemic heart disease. And they're at high risk of having uh, catastrophic events such as a heart attack or a stroke or, or kidney failure, or they, they might have an imputation, which then prevents them. Um, a, there's loss of life, which leads to loss of human capital. Secondly, those individuals who are ill, they're not able to go to work. And those who are able to go to work are not able to function properly. So there's a, a loss of productivity. Um, and there's also a decline in productivity for those who are able to um, attend work. And we estimated the economic cost uh, of this in, in the African context. And we estimated in, in sub-Saharan African context, the economic cost currently is around $20 billion, which is huge for a continent that has some of the poorest countries um, in the world. And as Atun said a moment ago, health systems are not prepared to deal with these unique consequences. And there are several reasons. First, there is simply low awareness of diabetes and its impact among patients, doctors, and policymakers. There is also a lack of diagnostic capability to actually tell when people have diabetes, and there's been limited uptake of international regulations regarding diabetes treatment. And one factor that's particularly concerning for Attune, because primary care systems in many sub-Saharan countries are not strong, there's a lack of continuity of care for those who have been diagnosed with diabetes. So we looked at what happens at every step of care from someone um, who might have um, diabetes to someone who might be diagnosed, uh, someone who's aware of diagnosis, those who receive advice, and the, those who receive medication. And we're able to use primary data from, uh, from 12 countries. Did a, f a very original study. We found that for every 100 people who have diabetes, 50% um, are not diagnosed. So we're already missing 50% of the population with diabetes. And of those who have their glucose measured um, uh, as part of a screening program, for example, uh, a further 13% are not aware of their illness. So we're down to 37% from that cohort. And of those um, uh, who are aware of their diagnosis, further 20% 20 do not receive advice. So we're down to... 17%. And of that group, 6% uh, do not receive treatment. So we're down to 11%. So for every 100 people with diabetes, only 11% receive treatment. Mm -hmm. That's on average. Some countries, this is as low as 8%. Mm -hmm. What are some of the factors that, that are driving that? Yes. Uh, yeah, I think that, that that was one of the fundamental questions we tried to address. <laughs> uh, you're, you're spot on. We found that uh, slightly different patterns, actually, in countries. So in some countries, there would be good screening programs. Uh, for example, in the case of um, Seychelles, they, they have a good screening program, but then there's no follow-up. 
In other countries, for example, countries such as Liberia, where health systems are severely stressed due to Ebola and, and, um, and other problems, um, there is no screening. So only 19% of those who have diabetes have their glucose measured. Then we see an attrition. In countries such as Mozambique, um, again, we see a rapid decline and an attrition. But in countries like Namibia and South Africa, we saw that um, although there is a decline, or in Tanzania, once someone, is, someone has their glucose measured, then there is care, but we see attrition at every step. Mm. So what we see is either very weak health systems, where all of these steps are not managed effectively, or systems where screening might work, or systems where uh, once someone is diagnosed, there is not enough comprehensive care to enable them to receive advice and ongoing care or ongoing treatment. Mm -hmm. So multiple reasons in, in terms of the health system functioning. Of course, one of the big problems is not just the supply of services, it's also the awareness and education and the literacy of the population in relation to diabetes. So what can be done to prepare health systems to deal with this rising challenge of diabetes? It's a difficult balance because countries don't want to see the progress they've made against HIV or in improving the health of mothers and children. Instead, Atun says the focus should be on improving primary care systems, which can benefit everyone, and identifying opportunities to use existing health system platforms to address diabetes and other chronic illnesses. This is something that we really try to explore, what platforms we can use uh, that are existing to enable health systems to effectively respond. Um, for example, platforms for delivering antenatal care or children's um, uh, interventions for children can be used for education purposes, or mothers who are attending uh, clinics can be um, screened appropriately for diabetes and provided appropriate advice. And if the pregnancy is well managed, then the children uh, who are born are, have less propensity to, to develop um, diabetes, so-called the first thousand days, uh, critically important to, to manage that. And, and the interventions begin actually during pregnancy or even before. Um, one can use uh, platforms for HIV. Those individuals who are on antiretroviral treatment are, are being managed effectively. Many of them will develop diabetes or hypertension, so one could introduce a, a program uh, to manage these chronic conditions. There's strong association between tuberculosis and diabetes, so one could manage these conditions jointly. Mm -hmm. So rather than creating a separate vertical program, one could try and use the existing platforms. But most importantly, we must strengthen primary healthcare systems mm -hmm. uh, and develop an approach that enables us to focus on the individual rather than on individual diseases. Mm -hmm. This is um, which leads to fragmentation and inefficiency. It's not like the health systems have to start from scratch. They, it's more about leveraging existing things that are already in place, using those to, to address diabetes or other, or other chronic illnesses. Yes, and, and I think the timing is also right. International institutions, countries, and, and uh, worldwide, there was a huge effort to address the high burden of HIV, AIDS, malaria, TB, and maternal and child health. And many of these pro targeted programs were developed, but there's not time to integrate these. Mm -hmm and integrate them in such a way that we develop strong primary health care systems and well-functioning health systems. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, that cascade of care that is so dysfunctional is going to continue. And the economic consequences, we projected that unless, you know, used with the current scenario, if, uh, if we don't intervene, the, the economic burden uh, to 2030, and that's only 15 years, will triple to almost uh, $60 billion. So it requires kind of, I mean, I think the, the you know, the, as you pointed out in the report, this kind of need for, like, urgent action. Absolutely. And we should not make the same mistake as with, with, with uh, HIV and AIDS. There's an opportunity now, given that one of the sustainable development goals, the third sustainable development goal is, uh, is ensuring healthy lives and promoting well-being for all at all ages. And one of the targets within that is uh, to achieve universal health coverage. And another one is to reduce by one third premature mortality from non communicable diseases through prevention, promotion, and, and treatment. Mm -hmm. So one should use this strong momentum globally 
to really target diabetes and other chronic illnesses. As we mentioned at the beginning of the episode, this Lancet Commission report is the first study to really examine this diabetes epidemic in sub-Saharan Africa. But Attunes is identifying the problem is only the first step. Now it's time to identify solutions. The next step, he says, is getting policymakers in affected countries and leaders in so-called donor countries, nations that provide foreign aid, to support diabetes interventions. That means researchers will be looking to document the approaches that work and also highlight the return on investment if diabetes and other chronic illnesses are managed effectively. If you want to read more about this Lancet Commission report on diabetes, you can visit our website, hsph.me slash thisweekinhealth. That's all for this week's episode. A reminder that you can listen anytime on SoundCloud, iTunes, or Stitcher. 